housing supply crisis, labor and material shortages, recession, inflation, high interest rates, migration pressures, increased living expenses, and changing social expectations around housing standards. These are not new terms or concepts to us here in Brisbane. These issues have existed since the very early days of European settlement. I mean, I think back to my parents' generation, they are always talking about the days of 15% interest rates. Or if you go back to, I think it's 1910, that is the first moment in Brisbane's history where we start to hear about the concept of a nuclear family. So where people wanna get away from that whole share housing concept and get into their own private family little space. Or if you go back to like 1842, we were dealing with ridiculous migration and a skills labor shortage way back then. Now, ever since these issues have existed, we've had government and private enterprise trying to come up with creative solutions to address these issues. So if we go back to 1842, like I was just talking about, back then they introduced what I think was called the building lease scheme. So basically they said, if you're a new migrant to the area and if you've got low economic means, what you can do is you can erect a temporary structure like a tent or a box of hut on crown land. And you pay, I think it was 10 pounds a year for that privilege. Now, unfortunately, because it was a temporary sort of lease thing, people weren't encouraged to put a lot of care into their dwellings. So these dwellings became these real slum shanty type towns. They were not pretty. And unfortunately, because of the economic problems at the time, people didn't have the ability to get themselves out of that situation. So what they had to do was basically say, we're only going to extend your lease once. So you can only get a maximum of two years type thing. And you need to be demonstrating during that period that you're actually actively trying to get yourself out of that situation. So yeah, there's always been problems. There's always been people trying to come up with solutions and there's always been modifications to those solutions. Now, why am I talking about this here today? Well, back in uni and planning 101, they always drill into you that you should be looking back to the past so that you can learn from it, so you can leverage from what worked and you can kind of make sure that you're not wasting time and energy on the things that didn't work. So given all the chatter in the media at the moment about the housing affordability crisis, the rental crisis, the cost of living crisis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, I thought it might be a good moment to actually stop and look back at our past, see what we have done in the past so we can learn from it from the future. So today I'm actually going to interview Marianne Taylor, AKA the house detective. Now she is an absolute wealth of information when it comes to our history here in Brisbane. So I thought I'd have a chat to her about some of the policies that were in play or schemes that were in play in our most formative years. So I'm looking at between 1900 and roughly 1950. Now I do need to stress that this is not gonna be a deep dive on this topic. There is no way we can go deep on this in one short little video. What I'm gonna do is kind of scratch the surface, let's just say. The aim of today is basically just to open people's minds to what was done in the past so we can start to question and learn for it for the future. Let's do this. Okay, so let's just launch straight into it. Share your wealth of knowledge. Where are you going to take us on this journey? Ooh, where do I begin? <laughs> where do you begin? <laughs> well, in my um, work researching houses, I've kind of had to learn about a number of different social housing schemes. Yeah. And there was a variety of them over the 20th century. The first one started in 1909 in Queensland. I think Queensland was the first state to introduce any form of social housing, which blew me away. You're a trailblazer, I love that. Yeah, I know. I was as shocked as you. All the jokes about Brisbane being behind the times. <laughs> I, know. Nah. I know, I know. So this was the, and I, like Peter said, I won't go into too much detail because I'm guilty of that often. But the first one was the Workers' Dwelling Act. And it was basically the goal of this act was to enable people on lower income, so workers used as a general term, to afford to own their own houses. Yep. So this, when I say workers, what they were meaning was basically kind of the old mentality of the working class. So it was tradespeople, um, artisans low-level labour is that type of thing. So okay. um, we sort of don't have the same class systems now, I guess. But, you know, low socioeconomic people but still employed. And the idea was to get them to build new houses. So this scheme was all about the the applicant owned their own block of land and the government would loan them money at low interest and low deposit to build their own house. So they had to first purchase the land they had and to the own a block to be able to land. do that. That's yep. right. They had to own a block of land and it could be anywhere in Queensland and they also had to be, they, the government was really good at scrutinising that they were actually able to repay the loans as well. So they only took low risk applicants on ah. and that was part of the reason the scheme was so successful was because they had very people default 
very, very, very few. few default on their pay repayments. So it was low interest um, in comparison to commercial loans available. It was a small deposit and the person would own their home at the end of it and already own the land. So they'd have a house and land at the end of it. And it was an incredibly successful scheme. Part of the reason that, part of the way they kept the cost down as well and kept the houses affordable was that they offered a limited number of designs that applicants could choose from. Yes. So they were, and, and but they were by no means poorly built homes. They were beautifully built homes with quality materials, but they were simple designs that were cheap to build. And because they were building the same styles in bulk, they could save costs on materials and labour. And I think the fact that they're still around today is proof oh. that they were such hardy, good quality designs. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. They're, they're quite incredible. And not just the materials, but the construction methods, you know, as you would know, yeah. you know, they're, they're just not, they don't make them like they used to. Exactly. So that was the very first scheme. Um, it sort of had various iterations over the years and it was updated to keep pace with increasing costs of building houses and the minimum salary, there was a, a criteria that you had to earn under a certain amount to qualify. Yep. The salary gradually increased over the years as well to allow more people to be involved. Later iterations also you could, um, you could use it to buy um, an existing house. So oh. as you're moving into the 19... 1920s, I think it was, you could use use it to buy an existing house. And so there was a number of the social, there was a number of Queensland government schemes that evolved and eventually became the State Advances Corporation and the Queensland Housing Commission. And so they were all about building new houses initially, but then later on it was used to finance existing houses and even land in some cases, the purchase okay. of those. But they all shared the same a goal, I guess, which was for people on lower incomes to get into their their own houses. Um, there was also different, another different scheme where instead of owning the house outright, you paid a small monthly rent and you had held the house in under a perpetual lease. So it was basically as good as owning a house. So like the rent to buy schemes that you hear Similar about these Similar to that, days. yeah. And okay. that was another scheme they offered as well. So this one, um, eventually, once you paid off the value of the house, exactly that, you would own the house. Um, and if you couldn't pay it off, then it was still cheaper than paying commercial rents. So it was basically, um, yeah, they were, they were about getting people into their own homes yep. effectively. Yeah, so okay. they all had the same principle. Then there was later, and I'm already getting into a bit of detail, but then there was later, <laughs> after the First World War, there was, um, some people would have heard about it, war service homes yes, schemes. Yes, i heard which was, about this. Yeah, yep. so this was, as opposed to being a Queensland scheme, this was a national scheme. And it was basically about everyone worrying about the veterans returning from the First World War being able to get into housing and get their families housing because in America the scheme was called Homes for Heroes, but it was the same. Catchy name. Same, I like that. I know, I like that. <laughs> but it was the same idea. It was these, these guys, and it was only guys, um, servicemen, they had served the country and so the least we can do is make sure that they have a home and for their family. Too. Yeah. Yep. Um, and that scheme later extended to be their female dependents as well, so widows if the men didn't return or you know elderly mothers, that type of thing as well. Okay. And that scheme was buying land or building a new home or buying an existing home and land or enlarging a current house. So that was a much um, broader, more, very sorry. broad and much broader yeah, spectrum. spectrum. Okay. Yeah, so... And really, I, I can't see why any of these schemes wouldn't work today. It's just really having a government, I think, that's willing to implement it and and give it a shot, really. Yeah, yeah. well, what I'm seeing here is, okay, there was a need for it, whether mm. it's economic downturn, returning mm. from war, whatever the situation mm. is. There was a need, there was a creation of policy, but more importantly, there was modifications to the policies. That's right. It wasn't very rigid like the early days of the workers when you're talking about you had to own the block of land and then you could get the help to be able to build the house. But then it approved, it moved to, okay, we well can buy existing blocks of land and all that sort of stuff. That's right. And they also, I think it was the State Advances Corporation Act, um, they even increased, they gradually increased the amount the maximum amount you could borrow as well um, and the percentage of the value of the house that you could borrow increased if that makes sense so originally you could only borrow up to two-thirds the value okay. of the house and land like the proposed house and land yeah that gradually increased to be a, uh, being able to borrow up to 80 percent 
and so on as it went along and the deposits decreased as well and I think that a low or no deposit I think it would probably be the key these days because it's just so hard for anyone to save that initial yes. amount isn't it so yes. that's something that I would be recommending not that I'm an expert but, yeah. <laughs> let's not over yeah, that yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for all you red tape lovers out there I have one thing to say well no actually I've got three number one the advice provided in these videos is general in nature. It's not site specific. You would be a silly billy to go and make financial decisions based on this advice without first checking with the town planner. Don't be a silly billy. Number two, Brisbane town planning is in no way linked to Brisbane City Council. The views expressed in these videos are my own, not council's. So if you don't like them, blame me, not council. Number three, what was my number three? Oh yeah. The views expressed in these videos are accurate at the time of recording. If you're watching this video back 10 years from now, the views may not be so accurate. That's all.